Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on property options in a post-pandemic world. My name is Tracy Bird and I run the SCBO Information Service. And thanks to you all for joining us today. And just to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available later on the SCBO website. Also, we will send out all slides and any additional resources to you all after this webinar by email. So our world of work has changed significantly in the last year, and some of these changes may be permanent. The pandemic has normalized remote working for many, and some organizations are now considering a hybrid remote office model and are looking at whether they really do need their current premises. So today we're going to look at the options available if you're thinking of reducing your property portfolio or relocating or reviewing the space you have or even considering new premises. I'm delighted today that we have with us Richard Smith and Kenneth Pinkerton from Brodie's, who are partners in the SCVO Free Legal Advice Service. This offers SCVO members up to two hours of free legal advice on topics ranging from property and employment law to governance and charity law. And I'd also like to welcome my colleague, Alistair Dutton, who is head of, our, of infrastructure and technology at SCVO. And he's going to share how we are adapting our property strategy, making changes to the buildings and working with partners to build more flexible collaboration options. So um, just before we get started, um, I would like to just do a quick poll. And this is really just to get a sense of where you're all at right now. Uh, so what I want to know is as restrictions ease and offices begin to reopen, what are your thoughts on the future of the way you think your organization will work? And there's just three choices here. Um, so do you think your staff are gonna be working from home? and they're gonna to continue to do this permanently. So maybe you're gonna to have to reduce your property portfolio or um, you're gonna to return to full-time working, but you're gonna to have to review the space you have. Or are you thinking about adopting a hybrid model? So you're gonna have an office space with some homeworking as well. Um, okay, so I it's changing all the time here. I think the majority here are thinking about adopting a hybrid model of working. And that's certainly, I think, the way SCBO is thinking and um, a lot of organizations. So that's great. Thank you for taking part in that, appreciate that. Um, I would encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A facility as we go, um, particularly as we've got access to a lot of legal knowledge here today. And now I'm gonna hand over to Richard and Kenneth um, from the Brodie's team. Thank you. Hi Richard, you're on mute at the moment. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to get set up. And hopefully you can hear me and you can see me, Tracy. Is that okay? Thanks. Yes, all good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tracy, for that introduction. And uh, thanks uh, on behalf of Kenneth and uh, and I for the opportunity to speaking today. Um, uh, also, thank you for you, all the attendees who've taken the time out of the days to, to come and hear what we've got to say today. Um, introductions, first of all, of who we are. Um, my name is Richard Smith. I'm a partner in the real estate team in Brodie's in principally working at the Glasgow office. We're a business of over 750 people. We've got 116 partners in the business as well. And uh, we specialise in all sorts of legal uh, sectors across the, the, the whole market as required across the whole of the United Kingdom. I've spent nearly 30 years advising clients across the whole of the UK on real estate matters, principally occupancy requirements. Uh, and I've got an interest particular in advising charities over the last 10 to 12 years on their occupancy requirements. Um, Charles Hay was supposed to be joining us as well. Charles is a managing associate who sits in the team with us as well. He represents principally a lot of the housing associations on the charitable side in terms of the residential requirements that we've got as well. Charles can't be here due to a last minute emergency. So um, I'll be speaking on behalf of Charles's stuff as well. And Kenneth Pinkerton, Kenneth, our director of charities. Kenneth, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Richard. Uh, yes, I am. Director of Charities in the Third Sector here at Brodie's with 
almost or over now 20 years experience acting for and working with charities and in charity law which starts to make you feel very old when you're throwing about figures uh, like that. I am the co-head of our charities and third sector team which is a team of specialists across the firm who regularly uh, act for charities and that covers everything from charity law and governance which is me to property Richard and his team GDPR contracts litigation really the full suite of legal services that charities might require. I am also a trustee and I should declare that I am a trustee of SCVO and have been for just a little over three years now. Um, I am also a trustee of Enable Group. Um, in addition to that, along with Tracy, I am a member of Scotland's Third Sector Governance Forum, which organises Trustees Week and it also owns Scotland's Third Sector Governance Code. And Tracy and I are involved in a little bit of research at the moment about the use of the code. Um, and it would be really helpful to us if you are, as, a, as basic a question as, if you are aware of the code, can you please just put yes in the chat box? We're doing a little bit of a survey about how high its profile is. And I will now pass back to Richard to give his talk. Thanks, Thanks very much. Kenneth. Richard, just before you start, can you ask you just if you can make the PowerPoint full screen so that we can um, see it better? Uh, Technology is not my strong point, so. You're also asking the wrong person, so. Richard, if you go onto the display settings, you should be able to fix it there and just click um, swap that, prick that button there, yeah. Is that any better? There you go. Yep, that's it. That's really perfect. Great. Okay, thanks. Well, that Thank gives you, you um, bigger logos on the screen and gives you an, an idea of the type of clients that we, 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 we've been representing on the charitable side. As, as, as Kenneth said, it's across not just the governance side of things, but in terms of their corporate structure, their pension liabilities and any pension deficits which exist from building um, dog sanctuaries for charitable care causes such as S a SPCA. And also from the retail side of things, um, in terms of the high street shops for Save the Children and Sue Rider, plus of course office requirements, we've most recently been involved in assisting Macmillan with their office changes in Glasgow and Edinburgh in particular. So that gives you an idea of the type of client base that, um, that we cover. Um, when Charles and I first had the conversation about setting up this chat today, it's always very difficult for lawyers to come up with things that are relatively amusing um, and we came, Charles came up with the idea of should I stay or should I go, which some of you may remember from a certain song. So for the chat bar, without using any form of Google, if those of you who are old enough to remember could perhaps say who sung the song, should I stay or should I go, and the exact date that it was released, then we'll see if anybody um, gets that correct and there'll be a small prize sent to someone who manages to achieve that. Um, in running through the options that the charitable entities think about, should I stay or should I go, nobody knows what's going to be the, the norm going forward in terms of our of, of both the occupancy in terms of offices, but also for the business premises or the retail side of things um, in, in the future. Two metre distancing, I'm sure we'll all have our own independent views as to whether or not that's actually going to be achievable or not. I had special permission to go into the office on Monday in Glasgow, which takes 210 people on one floor. I was one of four people in the office. Um, the reason I was in the office was because I had three completions which I'd done, which involved scanning in 60 page documents. I can't imagine a world where we're standing two metres apart, queuing for a photocopier and wiping down photocopiers in between every single person visiting that. So the challenges are faced by all occupiers and all business all, um, owners going forward as to how we're going to make this work. But obviously charities are exactly in, 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 that, in that status as well. We're going to look at the four concepts there. What space do you have? What space do you need? Is it more? Is it less? Do you need to have a larger office to accommodate the same people? And if so, how can you, how can you deal with that based upon your current parameters of your lease liabilities? Because we're assuming that for the majority case here, this will be leasehold property. Added to that, what liabilities do you have? Do you currently have or might you inherit depending upon the decisions which you might decide to try and take forward? Are your accommodation requirements permitted to be flexible enough or do you need to change your leasing structures to allow the flexibility based upon what you might need to keep changing? Because 
originally people would enter into leases for 10, 15 years on specific arrangements with no breaks and have to run that period, of course. That's a long time to ensure that your business will not need to adapt in that period. And that's really reflective of the fact that a lot of people are taking five-year leases with breaks at year two, year three, to ensure that they can accommodate that flexibility. So so what, what options do you have in terms of your current letting arrangements on main to have going forward? And then we'll touch on key dates because there's uh, a lot of points in terms of leases that you can take away from today, which you may or may not know. Um, it's not legal advice. It's telling you to actually go away and look at the documents, but to remember some key points based upon what the statutes actually say on this. So thinking about the space itself, um, are you a high street retailer? Are you a Save the Children or a Sue Rider or any other form of charitable organisation who's maybe got a shop that's had to close? that's open from the 20th of April because it's a non-essential retail store. It's opened and now is back to paying for some form of full rent or needs to catch up on historic rent. Maybe in fact, it's a good location for you. Maybe it's a good income provider for you. Um, think of the British Heart Foundation. They're a great example of a furniture store because that's what they are, who make a huge income from the ability to have a high street premises. Maybe they want to have bigger premises because bigger premises might be cheaper because rents have changed. Maybe there's an option to actually increase, therefore, the size of space that you want. Maybe on the right-hand side, you've got an option there in terms of your office premises. Your office premises might be set up for 12 people, but you're not going to have 12 people in the office at the same time. You might have three or four, depending on what happens going forward. Do you need to double the size of that to accommodate six or eight people? Do you need to reduce it? Do you need to go back to no people there. Do you need to have a PO box number and look at potentially going to some form of temporary office arrangement or rented desk ar arrangement? So it, it's looking at what those options are based upon your business requirements and how the strategy of your business is going to be going forward, probably over the next two, three years in this ever changing world. I think there's a lot of negativity thinking I'm going to have to shut down or I'm going to have to close offices. I think there's more options available to people going forward as to how they're actually going to operate. I mentioned 200 odd in our offices in one floor in Glasgow. I can't see us ever having 200 people on that floor at the same time. But when we took on board those premises, we took on board them in the knowledge that flexible office working was going to be a norm of, of, of the future and, and hot desk booking is going to be a requirement. Well, we didn't quite expect this to come along but we're no different from the charitable organisations who've got the same challenges in terms of space requirements looking forward. Just because you have those leases, you also have liabilities in terms of those leases. What I want you to try and think about is if you're stuck scratching your head thinking, what do we do with these, with these premises we've got? I don't want you going to your board of trustees on a government's question and saying, this is what we should do unless you've actually considered the full cost implications and the liabilities which you currently have under your under your lease structures. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get full legal advice on that. You can look at the documents yourself and you can go through what your lease documents say because they will be public documents registered at the Boots of Council in session in Edinburgh. But if you take on board a lease, you take on board a repair obligation to repair a property into a certain good state, state of um, condition and repair. And at the end of the period of that lease, whenever that occurs, a landlord will tot up what your responsibility is to make that property into a good condition. And in doing so, he will quantify that and either try and get some cash off you or he'll ask you to do a hell, a hell of a lot of work. And those works need to be done consistent with what your lease liabilities actually say. That might mean of saying, oh, well, actually, my lease expires next year, so that's fine. We don't have to pay rent after next year. But actually, have you quantified what that liability is going to be going forward in terms of repositioning walls, painting walls, replacing carpets, if that's what your lease says. So a dilapidation schedule will set, set out exactly what that liability is if a landlord serves it on you with a lease coming up to expiry. Or alternatively, um, you might want to have a building surveyor doing that own advice for you and to work out what that costing is going to be. It's really important. The legislation and the common law in Scotland as to what that liability is has always been different in England than it is in Scotland. But in Scotland, it's starting to go towards the English side of things. So if there's a scuff on the wall, historically, you'd have to paint the whole property to make it good. Now, a landlord's not necessarily going to do that. So there's the ability to try and wriggle out of that. So it's really important to get that advice. 
when you also look at the lease, look at the back of it, are there a lot of pages of photographs of the building and the premises that you've taken? Because if you have, that's called a scheduled condition and you don't have to put the property into any better condition than that actually exists. And that's a really good position to be in. And usually we find that charitable organisations in particular, well advised, will have those liabilities actually restricted to what the photographic schedule says. And that can save you thousands. What about the flexibility? What do you want to do with the property? Do you actually say, well, we don't know, we want to just hold on to it, but we want to save some costs in the short term? Maybe you've got a 10 year lease with seven years left to run and there's no there's no breaks there. Maybe you could sit there and say, well, actually, why don't we just try and rent out a few desks for the next six to 12 months, get some income from that and see if we can cover our costs for a short term before we see how all this settles down and we can look towards going forward in, in the future. Actually, how easy it is to make that happen? Think of the security points. GDPR was a point Kenneth mentioned there as well. Is it actually sensible for you to have other people in your property running their business, having access potentially to a lot of your private and um, confidential documentation? Is it right for have somebody in your premises which actually doesn't sit with the charitable purposes which you stand for and the reason for you being in that, in, in that property. And also what are the planning restrictions on those premises? Have you got a retail shop and you think, ah, oh, we might be able to move our offices into the retail? Is that actually per permitted, not just under the lease, but in terms of planning legislation as well? All of that information is usually available in terms of what the lease document says, and you will have that document you can look at yourself. But if you've thought about what the date was and you might be sitting there on a governance point of view thinking, we've actually got till choose a date, the end of this calendar year, and then the lease expires. Actually, if the 1st of April, we're out that property. As long as we get the dilapidation sorted out and we keep paying rent until then, we'll be okay. Because the 1st of January, we won't occupy that property. One of the most common positions we've found for non-advised clients is that they don't know that there's this bizarre concept in Scotland that you have to actually serve a notice to quit to terminate your lease. Just because your lease finishes on the 31st of December 2021, you have to tell the landlord the lease is definitely finishing. And that means you have to serve notice on the landlord at least 40 days. So over a government's point of view, if you decide today, we can't stay in this property anymore, it's not right, but the lease is expiring in December, serve your notice now, tell them that you're definitely leaving at the end of that. If you don't, and the landlord doesn't serve a notice on you, you have a thing called tacit relocation, which kicks in and means that the lease will continue for at least one year there afterwards and every year there afterwards. An extra year's liability on rent might not be something that you'd budgeted for in terms of your strategic plan, but if you don't serve your notice to quit, that's a big, big issue that you could be sitting facing with. Likewise, we've got break dates. You might have a three-year lease with a sorry, a five-year lease with a break at year three. Um, there's common law which is coming in now that's saying that um, the reason the break date was in there was to give flexibility. You've maybe got in there on a rent-free period to start off to get your, your business up and running, to get the to allow the charity to have the footing to let everyone know that they're there. And if after three years it's become so successful you need to move elsewhere, you need the flexibility to leave. That's what a break date is. But the common law has now changed to say, in some occasions, you cannot affect your break date by serving your notice if you're potentially in breach of your lease. So if you're behind on your rent, the landlord may, depending on what the lease say, have the ability to refuse to accept your break and try and hold you for the balance of the term of the lease. There may be a payment associated with that break date. So quite often we've seen leases which maybe have five years with a with a rent-free period of six months, but if you exercise the break at year three, you've got to pay the six months in rent back at that stage. When do you pay that? The lease will say it's got to pay at that particular time of serving the notice, or do you pay it before you expire? So be very, very clear around the conditions regarding the break payment if you need to exit on that, because if you get that wrong, you could be heard to the full balance of the term of the lease. And on the subject of serving notices itself, um, it's really, really important you serve it on the right entity. A lot of these buildings are changing hands all the time. The landlords are selling the building subject to the lease income to third parties who are coming in to collect that income. If you decide at a governance meeting of trustees today, we're going to serve the break option and we want to get out of this property by the break date, let's go ahead and do it. 
and you serve the notice tomorrow. But today the property's changed hands and you didn't know that. You might miss your break date because you might serve it on the old party and not, not the new party. That's one of the most common reasons for tenants failing to exercise their break options is because they've not gone through the procedures, usually of instructing a lawyer to say, you take responsibility for this and you get me out the term of this lease by exercising the break notice pro properly. So it's very, very important to look at those terms of the lease and make sure you comply with those provisions. Should I say, should I go was the comment that we started at the, at, at, at the point earlier on. Um, going might be on your own vote volition historically um, if you if you fail to pay rent or you fail to comply with lease terms in Scotland landlords have measures they can take against you they can they can forfeit the lease and it's called irritancy in Scotland um, the government last year introduced legislation by means of regulations which permitted a period of grace so for a tenant unable to pay its rent a landlord could not frankly boot a tenant out and a lot of tenants have had a lot of grace out of that, which has been great for them. It's the concept of Scots law of frustration of contract, where you're frustrated from actually carrying out the ability to occupy property. So tenants were saying, well, why should we pay rent for that? Well, the answer is you paid a, you've entered into a contract with a landlord to pay rent and occupy. Because of third party events happened, landlord doesn't care, he just wants his rent. Um, but the, the, the irritancy positions changed last year. And just as of the 16th of June last week, the government extended what was a 14 day period. So previously, if you didn't pay rent, you had a notice served on you to say, you've not paid rent, you've got 14 days to pay it, or the landlord could terminate the lease and come after you for the full lot plus costs. That 14 day period was changed to a 14 week period. And that week, 14 week period relaxation was up until the end of September of this year. The government just put forward proposals, which is not legislation yet, but should go through um, Holyrood in the period of next week, which will allow that holiday period, that relaxation period to be extended to March next year. I'm not suggesting to any of you who may be occupiers, great, let's not pay rent. Let's take, let's take the full advantage of this because the costs still mount up and the interest still mounts up. You're just paying off the evil day where you have to actually pay things. So but that's a benefit at the moment, but it might be something you could take account of if you're still deciding whether you should stay or go. And can you maybe roll something into some sort of discussion you might want to have with your landlord on that? And another point I think is important, which might be relevant in terms of varying leases, or if you stay, but you decide to go in the same way by having a new lease of the same property. We've got a thing that's called a COVID rent holiday, which is to much to the discredit of the landlord's requirements at the moment crept into the market, um, where a lot of occupiers of property have managed to be successful in writing a clause into a lease that says in the event that it is not possible to occupy the property because of a pandemic or because the, of, of government regulations, um, the rent is automatically reduced. So to put that into the concept of just what's happened since Christmas, um, retail closed down at Christmas just uh, at Christmas time just at 2020 there. Um, if that period had been covered in terms of a COVID rent clause under a lease, then what was recent what I've seen is 25% of rent is due and there's a 75% rent holiday. So for the period from Christmas Day up until the 20th of April this year, 75% redu rent reduction for a tenant, 25% only due. 75% essentially written off, but the 20th of April was the date by which non-essential trading was allowed to occupy, allowed to, allowed to open again, and therefore full rent kicked in for that for that period going forward. And we're seeing that appearing in a lot of office leases, and we're seeing that appearing in a lot of retail leases. So for those of you looking at your options about staying, going, wherever you do stay or to whether you do go, those are options that you should be looking at and clauses that you should be discussing with your agent to ensure that they're actually covered. So that's fine talking about lease termination. If you manage to get out your lease and you want to move on elsewhere because you have your break option because your lease is terminating. If you decide to stay, what are your options available to you? Well, of course you could sublet your property. Subletting the property needs a landlord's approval. Your lease will say that. 
So going to ask the landlord for permission to a third party occupier of the building is an essential requirement and you will be in breach of your lease if you do put someone else in there who has not actually um, got their permission to be there. Why? Well, quite often landlords have got bank loans for properties and the bank loans of the properties on the basis that the properties are let to an entity being the recognised charity entity that you are. Insurance requirements, the insurance policy says it's on the basis that that charity occupies that property as well. So just by putting somebody else in on a sublease without consent actually breaks up the chain all the way above and creates a number of breaches. You might decide that it's a 10 year lease with seven years left to go and you want it altogether. You can assign your lease, you can assign it across to a third party. You can find someone else who wants to take those properties where previously maybe they didn't want to take that size of the unit. Maybe you've got 2,000 square feet of office premises, but maybe there's a bank that actually wants to downside from 20,000 to 2,000 square feet. You actually might find your unit's quite marketable. But if you assign it across, you need to get landlord's consent because you will become an off responsibility for the lease and the new entity comes on board instead. Sharing occupancy. Hey, let's get someone else to occupy a couple of desks. The GDPR requirements of that, the security requirements for that, the um, the COVID requirements in terms of toilet sharing, common parts sharing, whatever, whatever. Again, it creates a number of a number of complications. So you have to get landlord's consent for that, and that will all be provided for in terms of your lease. So similarly, you might turn around and say, "Well, we'll stay, but we don't need the two floors we've got. We just want one floor." Can we partially surrender back or renounce one floor back? Landlord will want to make sure he maintains a certain rent per square foot of his premises. So again, that will require his, his consent. Or maybe, back to the example I gave, we just want to say, take the view that as soon as we're allowed to occupy, but none of our staff want to occupy, it's Tracy's survey at the start, hybrid working, do you know what, we don't want to do full office yet, can we get, wait 12 months and see how it is? You might want to say, let's put someone else in who does want to do that for 12 months. A license arrangement will require landlord's consent for that. And, and, and all of these involve cost, paying landlord's costs for that approval process. And I think the final one to think about is what the fit out cost is going to be to accommodate a third party coming in doing that. Or in case of partial surrender, maybe you've done some works you've got to dismantle pursuant to your lease terms to allow somebody else to, to actually come in. All of those points are so important to consider because when you sit at a charitable board of trustees meeting to decide on office strategy, retail strategy, residential strategy, or any form of property committee, it's wrong to simply say, let's just do this. It's right to say, here are the points we've considered. Here's what the lease says. And this is the contingency cost that we think this might have to be apportioned against that. That has to be balanced against potentially just writing out the cost of the lease. And that might make you decide that you should assign it to a third party or indeed look at some form of sublet. So let's think about going on to a new form of lease because you are going, but you're going either to stay in the same premises on new lease or you are deciding to go to brand new premises. What are you going to look for going forward? Clearly you want flexibility. You want the ability to, to have a property that you can subdivide as much as you possibly can. Landlords don't like lots of tenants all responsible for paying rent. They want one party responsible for paying rent and parties below that can maybe occupy if they're permitted to and the insurance allows it and the bank loan allows it, but they just want you on the hook for that as well. So make sure that as far as your flexibility is concerned, you've got those options available to you. And that takes you on to the ability to share possession on third parties. I'm sure there are a number of charities who are on this call today because we've witnessed it in terms of some of the advice we've given so far, who are looking at the future saying, we just can't survive on our own, but we're going to have to team up with other charitable organisations and we're going to have to share the responsibilities to make sure that we can survive through this as well. Well, just putting them into the building might involve a sharing possession structure, but actually might involve creating a new entity. And that entity needs to become the tenant under the lease to make sure it's compliant with the accounting requirements. I think you should be looking at break options going forward as well. Sounds obvious, but if it's worth paying a small amount extra per square foot, and by that I mean small, to have the flexibility to break the lease every two years or every year, I think it's worthwhile doing. 
because if you couple that with the next point, which is the scheduled condition, the repair obligation, you're just moving in and occupying. If it doesn't work, you could move back out again. At least you're covering your long-term liability by just making sure that that's covered in terms of, of, of the rent. COVID rent holidays, landlords out there will hate me for saying this, they're here to stay. That form of restriction and that form of benefit that a tenant should get will form a thing of, of the future and certainly up and down the high streets. That's what's becoming more and more the norm. And when it comes to the fit out point, usually a lot of leases sometimes say you can't alter the inside of your property without landlord's consent. Well, I think every single one of us is faced with new partitions. Do we put up bigger televisions so we can have Zoom calls as, as the norm? Do we change the size of the boardroom? Do we change the size of the number of desks and how they fit? You don't want to keep going back to your landlords to say, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Because of the changing way that the businesses are going to have to operate going forward. So you're looking to make sure that you're well advised and you've got a proper amount of flexibility in going, in, in going forward. That's a whistle stop tour through the types of options that you need to be aware of what you should be considering from a governance level. So when you come up and say, should I stay or should I go, you've actually got the full armory behind you as to what's permitted in terms of your lease and what you think is available in the market and that you should be able to achieve. That might dictate you stay and you ride out the balance of the lease. It might dictate that you want to share with someone else, provided you get the consents in place, or it might dictate you exercise your break options. And I have to say, you have to look at the, op the positives out here. Maybe you are going to bigger premises as an expansion, but the cost of those premises actually is pretty similar to what you were in beforehand because of the way that the market's going. But with the flexibility to remove yourself from that going forward, that might be a very, very good good consideration in the should I stay or should I go. So I'm not quite sure what the chat bar is saying in terms of um, the should I say, should I go, and when it was released, but for those of us old enough to remember, it is The Clash. It was uh, the 10th of June, 1982. I did like the line that if I go, there will be trouble. If I stay, it will be double. That may or may not come to pass, depending upon the options which you state. But don't be faced with those questions when you're sitting at a chat or a board, having that discussion and considering governance. And on the subject of governance, um, all of this is in the background, but then you have to consider what your duties are and across to Kenneth now to talk about the governance side of things and the trustees' duties. Kenneth. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> and certainly if I take off my, my charity lawyer's hat and put on my, my trustee hat, you've certainly highlighted the various complexities there are, and it's, it's not straightforward and it is a bit of a, a web of things that we have to think of as trustees or alternatively the senior leadership teams who are giving the information to the charity trustees to allow them to take the decisions that they have to take. So for the next five minutes or so, I'm just going to take us back to basics and speak about how you discharge your charity trustee duties um, in connection with property matters, indeed, generally uh, in decision making. So right back to basics, we have the general duties of trustees under Section 66 of the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005. And these are your core duties as charity trustees. So number one, you have to act in the interests of the charity. And what that means, if you skip back, Richard, yeah, that means that you have to set aside and manage any conflicts of interest. And it, it may well be that around the table you have a trustee who is also the landlord. I noticed somebody in the chat had said that he was a, a landlord and a tenant, possibly not of the charity. Um, but that person around the table, if he or she is a landlord, then they cannot take part in the discussions regarding the negotiations of rent or in relation to the property in general. And also, if you are in that situation, then as a charity board, you have to be mindful of the remuneration provisions in the 2005 Act, as that rent payable to a trustee will be remuneration. And broadly speaking, you can't have more than half of your board remunerated. 
you have to act in a manner consistent with the charity's purposes, and that is your charitable purposes. So everything you do has to either directly or indirectly further your charitable purposes. And this might be relevant, for example, if as a charity, you are a landlord or intend to be a landlord, and you move from, for example, occupying the premises as your headquarters for your staff, which is advancing your charitable purposes, to letting out a part of those premises to a n other. Um, and from that point of view, the nature of the asset changes from advancing charitable purposes to something akin to an investment asset. And in those circumstances, for example, at SCBO, which Ali will come on to later, we then considered who would we want to um, be our tenants. We want to align ourselves with people who um, you know, match our values. Uh, and that is a consideration you would have to, as Richard alluded to earlier on, think about who your tenant might be um, when you're going down that route. And again, that's a consideration because that might determine the level of rent. <clears throat> Act with the relevant standard of care. And that is the standard of care of a person looking after the affairs of another person. And that is generally taken to be a higher standard than if you're looking after your own affairs. And generally what that means is you the, the level of risk that you can take when um, taking decisions around property is less than where you an individual. Um, a common example is sometimes given that if you are an individual with and uh, you can do whatever you want, you have a hundred thousand pounds, you can go into the casino and you can chuck it all on red and just see what happens. You might make money, you might lose a whole lot, but who cares? If you are a charity trustee, you cannot do that. You have duties to take care of that cash. And the same applies to decisions around property. The last duty under that slide is a very particular one, which applies to um, trustees who are appointed by another organisation. And typically that would be, um, for example, a council who has the right to appoint trustees onto a charity. So in those circumstances, again, if the council was the landlord, the charity is the tenant, and there are council or trustees there, then those council or trustees cannot take part in any of the discussions or decision making surrounding the property. If you could go to the next slide, please, Richard. There's a very useful piece of guidance published by the Charity Commission for England and Wales called It's Your Decision, Charity Trustees and Decision Making, and it sets out what charity trustees should be thinking about when they have decisions to make and I find it very useful when there are complex decisions to take. Some are covered and you'll see the relevance or the comparison with the section 66 duties. So for example you have to act within your powers, you have to make sure you have the power to do what you are doing, act in good faith and only in the interest of the charity. So again that's dealing with your conflicts of interests. Back to one of Richard's points, make sure that you are sufficiently well informed. You may have a trustee round the table who thinks he knows what the values are, thinks he knows what the law is. I'll look at that lease for you. No, not a good idea. Get proper advice. Take account of relevant factors and ignore relevant factors. As I've said before, manage your conflicts of interest your trustee landlord or the tenant round the board, then you have to make sure that they are not taking part in the discussions. And leading on from that, then that can have an effect on your quorum, the second bullet point there. If you have uh, uh, trustees who have conflicts of interest and can't take part in the decision-making process, then that can sometimes affect the number of people required to take the quorum, or it might mean that you don't have enough people to take the quorum, which can present challenges. The first point there on that slide, 
I really like. And I think it gives us as trustees and their advisors some comfort. As we have learned and has been highlighted over the past 18 months or so, nobody but nobody has a crystal ball. And it is impossible to know almost what will happen tomorrow, never mind next month, never mind next year. And what this is saying is that as a trustee, you can only make a decision amongst the range of decisions that a reasonable trustee board could make. In any decision, you always have the status quo and then you can always do something else, even if it's the Armageddon option. Um, and if you have followed your trustee duties, you have a reasonable set of options and you pick one and six months later, so if you decided to stay in the property because you thought you were going to go great guns and you were going to get somebody in to share and you pass that break point in the lease, and then six months later, you can't get anybody and you're, you're really struggling. If that was a reasonable option at the time and you had information and advice to back that up, then you will not be criticised or you, well, you may be criticised, but you will be clear as you will have discharged your trustee duties, you will be clear from liability. As a board, you take decisions collectively. So if it comes to a vote on what you should decide to do and the majority decide to stay, then everybody in that room stands by and is bound by that decision. Because you decided to go the other way does not mean that you have no liability or no responsibilities, a better word, in respect of that decision. Just now, um, we are looking at many constitutions, which, for example, don't allow for electronic meetings for constitutions. They might not have procedures to allow for proxy votes or to take um, decisions by a written resolution procedure. So just check that so that if you are taking a decision outside of a meeting and you can't have electronic meetings, I'm sure you're all sorted out by now, then take care there. You'll remember at the start, Oscar was fairly relaxed about not having these powers to take, have electronic meetings. We're seeing a hardening up there from Oscar um, and they're really taking the view now that you've had sufficient time to get these things sorted out. On the point of delegation, you may well be delegating to a committee to look at the property matters uh, for larger charities. That is probably the case. Be sure that the committee knows, be sure that you know what are you delegating? Are you delegating the decision power? Or as is most likely the case, and as the case at SCVO, you are delegating the sort of investigatory requirements. You're giving the depth to the level of investigation and reporting that's required. And Richard, I know that you had an example there. You're a trustee at Glasgow Academy of how things work there. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, we have a number of subcommittees which work there and I chair the operations committee. Um, but if, or there are property decisions that need to be met, not only do we have to have the quorum recorded as exactly as you said there, Kenneth, for the operations committee, but then it has to go to the finance committee for ratification or further questioning as required. And then from that, only once there is unanimous approval from both subcommittees, does it go to the full board to make the decision, because clearly that decision is a decision that all the board members and all the trustees are bound by and has to be obviously in the best interest of the school. But it does give us a very, very good um, rain check because it's very easy to get isolated and embroiled in just the one subject but without looking at it from the out from the outside in mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a good procedure to go all the way through um it's a tough procedure but it works yeah, it works. yeah. Th thanks richard and it may well be that decisions around this nature might be under delegated authority to the chief executive and her team um and if that is normal business classes, day-to-day -day business, then that, that might well be the case. If it's a strategic decision to take you out of property altogether, then that would be a, a different decision. That's definitely a board level decision. And finally, record decisions properly. So there's no doubt about what was decided and why. And a lot of that comes down to good minute taking. Make sure you have your reasons there as to why you have come to the decision, the evidence that you have or the reports that you have, you as good practice, you should attach those reports to the minute 
so that in six months time, 12 months time, when somebody comes back and says, why did we do that? You can go exactly, you can go straight to the minute and you have the reasons why um, the decision was taken. So on that note, I will, um, we're going to pass over to Ali, who is going to go through the CVO procedures. Thank you. Um, afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Okay. Uh, is that working for everybody? Tracy, if you can see it, can you? Thumbs up. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Alistair Dutton. I, I head up the infrastructure team at SCVL, which is broadly speaking property and IT stuff. Um, and just in, in a fairly short presentation, just to kind of cover where we're at, where our thinking's at and where we might be going, and also to kind of highlight some of the gaps um, that we've got at the moment, some of the uncertainties and things, um, particularly some of the ones that Richard alluded to right at the start. To give, to give an, an overview of our property, um, we've got four sites that we operate. So in then they're kind of mixed ownership and leasing. So in Edinburgh, we're in a long-term lease in a category A um, listed church um, that's been repurposed. We can accommodate about 150 or so um, desks within that. And then there's an event space upstairs for about 400 individuals. Um, in Glasgow, we operate across two sites. We have a building in Merchant City and also a property in Brunswick, uh, sorry, in Sucky Hall Street in um, Glasgow. And the two between the two of them, that's around about 340 desks plus um, some limited event space within there too. And then our last property was one that we purpose built ourselves up in Inverness a few years ago um, out of town. And that across two floors host around about um, 80 individuals. Um, so they're kind of mixed bag of um, properties that we own and one that we lease as well too. And that long-term lease is kind of got about two years um, to run in it. So we're at the stage of thinking with that, what the future looks like as well too. Um, our models kind of, I think somebody in the chat had, had a similar model as well too. Our models are kind of mixed one. So our buildings serve two main purposes. They're a home for our staff um, and running events in, in normal times. And they're also a hub for partners as well too. So we run the spaces in, two main ways. We have bespoke four walls and a door kind of closed spaces that are, are, are offices within offices. And then we also have open collaboration areas um, kind of co-location co type um, thing, which are kind of built around a kind of sense of community. Um, and there's a high degree of flexibility and kind of come and go with that as well too. And we also kind of unique to us as well too. We have in Edinburgh, we have um, a space which we um, we work with a private sector company to um, run boutique events upstairs, so weddings and um, kind of corporate events too. And that's really a kind of, or has been, um, uh, an income generation thing for us as well too, for unrestricted income. That obviously had gone by the by, but we're starting to see the kind of green shoots of recovery a little bit with the event side, which is, which is good because it's important to us. Um, where we're at now, um, Obviously, like everybody else, um, the pandemic stuff stopped kind of on-premise activity almost overnight, um, about 24 hours, and um, we had to basically close down our buildings. Um, we have had some limited access with some of the partners that we've got that are providing um, essential services, and particularly early on around PP equipment and things like that, um, but 95% um, have been remoting. The big thing for us, and, and again, Richard, is, is, is this is still a high degree of uncertainty around where we'll end up and what the future will be. Um, things are starting to become clearer. Dates are becoming slightly more firm now. Um, talk of differences in social distancing between two metres and one metre has a massive impact on the number of people that we can physically get in the buildings, not just at desks, but in common areas, corridors, toilets, staff rooms, et cetera, et cetera. And until we really know that, I, I don't know if we can make the kind of informed decisions um, as to what our pro overall property strategy should be. I think it's coming very soon. Um, but for me, that's still the biggest question mark. We're, we're also, and, and this is becoming a, a, a bit more focused, but we, we have for our own staff, um, 
been getting kind of mixed views from some of the feedback that we've asked in terms of surveys and attitudes have changed um, over the last 12, 18 months. Um, and we're going to kind of drill down a lot um, more on that over the next few weeks to try and actually see where people are at. We've second guessed some of the adaptations so far. So like a lot of you, um, we've done things like we've put in digital signage um, to be allow a high degree of flexibility, to encourage social distancing, to mandate mask wearing when people are moving around, to encourage people to, to wash their hands, et cetera. Um, and those, those signage has been what we try to do with the whole thing across is to make the experience as welcoming as we can. Um, so we've avoided things like putting kind of health and safety tape across areas over um, prescriptive signage. We've kept it to try and keep it in a kind of friendly and encouraging way. Um, and we've also had to kind of clear down all our spaces as well too. Um, so we've now got a situation where we've got, got basically clear desks everywhere and there's hand sanitizers, et cetera. So a, 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 lot, a lot less clutter and things like putting in, for example, fire stops on the doors to keep the doors open. So we've made a small investment, um, not, not a huge investment yet in terms of, of changing the buildings and the way they work, um, but enough to allow a phase return. Once things become clearer, then the kind of investments that we make um, and how we repurpose the buildings um, will, will hopefully come, in, come into a much sharper focus. Um, so we love a knowledge board at SCVO. So, so what we know is we know surprisingly that there is still a high degree of demand for, for space. Um, it's changed a lot. It's moved to the demand is, is I would have thought early on that the demand would have been for closed confined spaces um, that, that partners can kind of basically shut off and they can manage themselves. But what we're actually seeing is the demand at the moment for collaboration desks for, for open plan. And I think that's twofold. I think it's one, it's about flexibility so that the numbers can go up and down. And the other reason I think too, is that people, maybe there's an, a wanting for a sense of community and wanting to see people again, but maybe not all the time. Um, so they want to come back into these spaces and things. So I, th I think those are the two things that, that notice. We think we know that there's gonna be a continued demand. Um, for presence in city centres, but we don't know that for sure yet. Um, we're, we're, say we're seeing lots of interest, lots of people renewing with us, but we'll see where it finally sits. Um, and the big bit again, just to reiterate that we don't know what the final guidelines will be um, and, and what provision we'll need to make within those buildings to make them work. And that has a huge impact on the number, the model that we have um, and how those spaces are done and what investment we need to make. And I still think it's too early to make informed decisions on that just yet, but I think that that's coming fairly soon. So where we are now, and my kind of closing remarks, is we have developed a property strategy um, uh, along, along with our, um, our board and our strategic resources committee. And we're looking at re-examining the spaces that we hold. Um, we're looking at what we need going forward and how those buildings might work. Um, one of the things that we're doing, which I'm finding incredibly useful from the feedback we're already getting, is we are running focus groups for our staff to determine what they need and what they think they will need, as well as our partners. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence around, and I've noticed a lot of people projecting other people's opinions and things on as well. So what we really want to do is, is, is use this opportunity to say, right, what's going to work? I know stuff will change as, 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 as hopefully things begin to unlock, um, and attitudes might change, but drilling down to that, that, what we've noticed is a really granular level of requirements. So that's really good. Another big thing um, that I think Richard or Ken mentioned was we, we've invested in software to make all of this work. Um, there's quite a lot of organizational management stuff to go on. So in terms of who's coming into the building, how frequently they're coming in, when they're coming in so that not everybody's coming in at the same time, um, the, the basic kind of questionnaire stuff, um, displaying symptoms, et cetera, that they go through before they attend on site, and also managing that hot desking. And all of that then informs things like the clean, cleaning regimes we do, where we need to, where we need to do, um, focus on, right through to things like if we need to do track and trace as well too, we've got that ability. Um, so, so, and that I think is gonna create, take a big, a big admin burden away. Um, and the final thing that, that we've, we've started to do is kind of change the narrative around our spaces and move 
from our traditional kind of landlord tenant um, kind of lease contract led type model to much more flexible collaboration spaces going forward um, where partners can vary the amount of desks that they need to is almost on a month by month basis um, and that they can get the services and wrap around stuff that if they had a large building and a large presence, they might invest themselves. If they got one or two desks, um, then they can come to us for everything. Um, and we've got small community-based organisations all the way through to Oxfam and UNICEF at the other end. Um, so that's pretty exciting. That's kind of my overview of where we're at. So it's still a lot of uncertainty, um, but things are starting to crystallise um, as we go on. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. And thank you, Alistair, uh, sorry, Richard and Kenneth as well. That was really fascinating, particularly that notice to quit thing that you talked about, Richard. I made a note of that. Um, we've got a few questions and just a few minutes left. Um, there is one that I can actually answer about the guidance from Scottish Government. Um, it is still the default position that you should work from home. Um, but you can get a lot more information on that on our own coronavirus information hub. So I'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, so that leaves the two difficult questions for the lawyers, I think. Um, so the first one we got in was from Jane Adams, and she wanted to know um, very quickly, if you can, what advice would you give to charities who are thinking about buying a property rather than taking out a 10 year lease? You know, what are the pros and cons? Um, should you buy a property? If you can, yes. Does your governance allow it? Kenneth's point, find that out first before you go any, any further. Money's cheap. Borrowing is cheap at the moment. Banks are very keen to lend to businesses to keep them going, provided that they are viable businesses. So borrow some money to buy it without exposing yourself unnecessarily. Giving your control of the building allows you to be flexible in how you occupy it. Consider which bit you want to occupy and it doesn't prejudice the ability for other people to come in and occupy and choose the right location um, because it, it could be an income producing asset, which you might even want to think about sticking in a pension fund associated with the charity as well. So it's a good thing. It shouldn't be dismissed, provided it's the right location. Yeah, I don't suppose there is a right or a wrong answer to that one, is it? <laughs> Um, okay, the other question is, um, is there any way we can go for advice on the impact of COVID on office lease rent costs going forward? Have they gone up or down? Um, the Martins landlord has offered to sell the office building to us, but the board really need to consider how this would be funded and how we would get an independent opinion as to what the building's actually worth. Yeah, this is coming up a lot, Tracy. This is um, what I would... Obviously, we work with a different number of agency surveyors because it's agency surveyors who come up with this kind of market intelligence. Um, we're not affiliated to any, anyone, but you've all seen the signs that say Ryden, Savills, Jones Lang or whatever. Uh, I would encourage anybody in that circumstances, Martin, just to drive down a street with offices in it in the nearest city that you're in. Look what the to let board signs are and those buildings, that those to let boards have businesses on them. and They are agency surveyors who will be able to assist you with that. They'll charge rates, but they also do charitable rates. I've just done a deal with Ryden, for example, who had a charitable rate with Macmillan, as indeed did, 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 did we. But from they have the market intelligence to work out what square footage of both retail and in some cases industrial uh, but also office rents have come to based upon whether they are category a to b or c uh, properties they'll give you the idea of the type of rent you should be paying for and therefore the price per square foot that you should be buying at and between them and the agency severe acting for the landlord you'll reach a compromise on what the appropriate deal will be once you've got that, if you're buying it and you're buying it with bank funding, a bank funder will probably want a valuer independently to look at that as well. And that will be included in your loan costs to allow you to go ahead and buy it or in the case of a renting structure to make sure the rent figure is correct. And I think if I could just very quickly add, that is the exact, um, this is the exact situation that that point on the decision making about um, making a decision amongst a range of options is exactly covered. We don't know what will happen. We don't know what valuations will be post COVID um, and neither will the surveyors as much as they will, will want to be able to say that you, they can. But as long as you've got all your ducks in a row from a governance point of view, then you will be from a discharging your uh, 
trustee duties, you're in exactly the place that you want to be. Great, thank you. Um, that is all about what we've got time for today, unfortunately, um, but I hope you found that fascinating and interesting like I have. Thanks to you all for attending and thanks to our panelists. Uh, don't forget, we've got a follow up webinar to this one on the 7th of July, and that's looking at flexible hybrid working more from a practical HR perspective. So if you're interested in that, you can book your place on our website. Um, as I say, we'll send out the slides. If you do have any queries about property, do get in touch with the information service. And if you're an SCVO member, then you can access both Kenneth and Richard's um, help for free for two hours. So that's a good deal. So um, thank you and goodbye. Thanks.